uh, to being here with us. Uh, we're so happy to put on this workshop. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gabby Robles. I'm the academic coach for the Caminos Project within the College of Education. And I was just really excited to have this collaboration with the Women's Gender and Equity Center, with CAPS, right? Have some of uh, the students from the Women's Gender and Equity Center here with us today as well just to really provide y'all with really great resources, things that are happening on campus, some tips and strategies for you all for stress management, right? And then um, end it with the panel with folks sharing their experience here at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, so we're excited for this hour and a half that we get with you all. Um, and please feel free to leave uh, questions in the chat, right? Or, or let us know your thoughts throughout the presentation. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and jump in, get started. and. And I'm going to hand it over to Brooke. Hi, everyone. Let me just pull up my presentation here. Can you all see that OK? Perfect. Well, hello. My name is Brooke Vaughn. I am a program assistant at the Women's and Gender Equity Center uh, here at CSULB. And I'm happy to be with you all today. I'm just going to start us off um, with a couple of acknowledgments starting with our land acknowledgement here. So we acknowledge the Tongva people as the traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands and are grateful to have the opportunity to work at the sacred site of Kavunga. We pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our rel relatives past, present, and emerging. Next, our labor acknowledgement. So we recognize and acknowledge the labor upon which our country, state, and institution are built. We remember that our country was built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the U.S. from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We also acknowledge all immigrant and indigenous labor, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples, who contribute to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. We recognize that our country is continuously defined, supported, and built upon by oppressed communities and peoples. We acknowledge labor inequities and the shared responsibility for combating oppressive systems in our daily work. So with that said, um, thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, this is our first part of our balance series, so I just wanted to take a moment to explain what the balance series is. So the balance series uh, was created by the Women's and Gender Equity Center. Balance stands for bridging academic leadership and nurturing community empowerment. So the balance educational workshop series is meant to support our pregnant and parenting students here on campus. So our first event here today is a better you. Next, we'll have a healthier you, and we'll put that information for that event next month um, at the end of our event. And then ending with a happier you. So that one's going to get you and your family involved. So we hope that you'll enjoy this event today and join us for the remainder of our series. I'll now pass it along to Pam. Oh, Pam, you're on mute. There you go. I realize that. Um, so some of the learning outcomes we'll have, um, we hope that at the end of this workshop, um, participants will learn okay. how to balance um, their school, their work life um, with themselves and their family. And as a result of attending the workshop, we are hoping that you will learn more about the campus resources. And, and also um, by attending the workshop today, we're hoping that participants will identify coping and self-care techniques for themselves and for their children. So finding resources for pregnant and parenting students on campus. So if you don't know, let's begin. So some of the campus services and support that the Women's and Gender Equity Center does, um, we're just we do advocacy accommodations through BMAC, um, the family friendly study area, which is on the second floor, the children's library section. We are currently doing a lot more work since we've been closed down for two years for COVID to get that back 
and um, running like it was. There's some broken things, but uh, we're hoping to launch this in the fall. All the area is still open and available for student parents to walk in. Um, we just noticed that it hasn't been as friendly with, with students that are studying there that aren't parents are kind of shushing parents that are. So we're really hoping to get that space back because at one time um, that really was open just for um, families to come in. But still, it, it come there because it is a great place to have your children. Um, on campus, child care is the Isabel Patterson Child Development Center. Um, you can go on their website. It's always um, important to check that out and to see what when. I don't say when, but um, there is limited um, ability for the um, to get into the child care. So you really have to get on a waiting list. So the sooner the better. So. Um, we try to get that word out to let students know that are transferring in. And then to get that emotional support and support um, with CAPS, and I'm sure Dr. Bradish will go over the Beach uh, Support Parent Group that she oversees. We do oversee the CalWORKS program to help with the um, paperwork and getting everything turned in for that. And then we do have lactation rooms and changing stations um, in our building, which is located in the SSSC or the Student Success Building right between one and a new science center. And we do have that campus wide now as well, lactation stations. And then just on and off campus referrals from the WGEC. And you can reach us, there's our contact number on the PowerPoint. And so really, um, you know, reach out to us. If you can't remember all these resources that we're going to go over today, remember that you can always come to the Women's and Gender Equity Center and we will be able to connect you to those services. And again, we've put on workshops with um, Isabel Patterson. It's a great child care development center. Um, just get that waiting list in now. Um, even if you think that you, you can't get in, just get on the waiting list. Um, it's a really great opportunity to be there. It's a great, great staff, and they give students priority um, to enroll. Next slide. So the family-friendly study area, this is kind of gives you a little idea of what it looks like. Um, it's on that second floor. If you just come in the building, go up to the second floor, it's just to your left. And it is a great area to bring your kids. There's books there, um, there's tables, and of all the places in the library, I think this is my favorite space. Again, we are working on um, trying to update this, get more activities for older children, as well as the younger children, some more games and things like that. And also in the fall, we're gonna roll out um, service learning students that will be able to be up there um, during certain times and help, um, I wouldn't say just babysit, but you know, interact with your child and keep an eye on them. They don't, they don't take children to bathrooms or change diapers, but they're there to kind of help you while you're there studying as well. So there is a lactation um, location there, also on the lower level in room 012. And um, if you look on the Office of Equity and Diversity, they you can find all the lactation spaces on on campus and we have a great one in our building okay next one okay so the isabel patterson um, child development center like i said earlier it's a great place to to put your children it's you know on campus so it's a perfect setting um, most of our student parents that have their children and i haven't heard a negative thing about the child development center and students are really happy to have their children there. There is contact information here, but please visit the website. They have all the information available as far as um, signing up and getting um, more information. Okay, next slide. So for students that don't know, we have a basic needs program on campus. 
And it really does connect you with a lot of things that you might need. And if you're fighting food insecurity, there's meal assistance programs through basic needs. There's also the CalFresh, they're able to help sign you up if you don't have that already. There's also, most students don't know, we have an ASI, a beach pantry. It's located in the University Student Union. And that's a great place to get fresh produce and other items. Um, it's really nice. If you haven't gone by there, I really highly recommend when you're in that area by the University Student Union to go see the beach pantry. And then assisting um, displaced students. Again, basic needs program has helped with um, emergency short-term housing, rapid rehousing, and this goes to our student parents as well as just any student um, on campus that is having these type of in, you know, um, needs, emergency needs. And they also have been able to provide financial support with emergency grants, gift cards, toiletry items, and really giving support um, in counseling, financial aid counseling, referrals. So really look at the basic needs. The website is here. You can find out more about it, but I really highly recommend um, looking at this because you never know. There could be things that you haven't tapped into yet. Okay, next slide. So there's also the Student Emergency Intervention and Wellness Program. And that's where we, we do this feed a need a pro, um, program and it's a meals assistance program. And we do it through the dorms and the, um, the cafeterias there. And so a lot of the students donate extra meals and then that's, that's where that becomes available. And like I said, there's that short-term emergency um, housing program and student emergency grant information. So really reach out to us or reach out here um, if you are facing that and we'll help get you connected to the services that you need here on campus. And then counseling and psychological services. A lot of students don't realize, you know, that CAPS is there for you. Um, there's some great programs, uh, there's short-term counseling, um, but also referrals outside um, if you need it long-term. There's group counseling, um, just so much if you just go under the CAPS web website to find out more information. Um, it's really a great place to, you know, in the topic of taking care of your mental wellness, CAPS is a great place to start. There's all, just everything that you can think of to um, support you um, through your academic and personal um, life and your graduation. So they're at Brotman Hall on, on the second floor and you can visit the website or you know just call. They do have emergency counseling if you need it right away. We also have an advocate on campus um, with the Student Health Center and she's our campus confidential advocate. That's more for any kind of um, sexual assault counseling, um, domestic violence counseling, anything like in that realm, um, she should be able to um, see you right away. And then you can still get into CAPS and we can also um, still get you into off-campus um, referrals as well. So don't suffer in silence is what I say. And then for Beach Parents Support Group, Dr. Abby Bradish oversees this through CAPS. Um, it's a beach parent support group. It's a drop-in space um, to a therapy space in CAPS. We used to have it over at the Women's and Gender Equity Center, but now it's over at CAPS. So you do have to be referred and it's highly recommended to call them. And, and it's a great support group. So I encourage you to really take advantage of this um, support group that Dr. Abby Bradish um, oversees. And there's the contact information there as well. Um, CAPS is always 562, that 9854001, and then Dr. Abby Bradish. And then the, for Student Life and Development, um, Pregnant and Parenting Student um, Association, they're a group on, a student group on campus that we're trying to get going again. It kind of took a little wavering during COVID and that's totally understandable. And our 
commissioner for pregnant and parenting students, who is also our student assistant. Um, she's trying to get this club back and active because all clubs to be recognized on campus, um, student clubs have to have their officers in place and have elections and things like that. So I highly encourage getting involved. It's a great group when they were in camp on campus and meeting at our office um, before COVID shut down. It was a, a real great, vibrant group of, of, of student parents that came together and they really had a good time together meeting and just chatting. And um, so here is the information on it, but you can always reach out to us, the WGEC and our commissioner for um, pregnant and parenting students to get involved. Okay. And again, as I just mentioned, the ASI commissioner for pregnant and parenting students, um, that is a great place if you are looking to get into leadership roles in you or you have a, you know, and this is great on your resume, but also it's important to understand that you have a voice on campus. And we didn't always have an ASI commissioner for pregnant and parenting students, but we do now. And that's a great step forward in, in realizing that you're just not this invisible group on campus, but you have a viable voice. And, we wouldn't have had the lactation stations and the EBT cards usage on campus if it wasn't for our student parents pushing for that and saying, hey, you know, we're here and um, we need space too. And even the USU and the ASI is taking note of that. And I'm sure at one point when the USU gets redesigned and rebuilt because it's a very aging building, um, that will be a big consideration for student parents. And you want to have your voice heard and you want to be part of that conversation. So again, uh, you'll hear from Salema later, but she is our commissioner currently for ASI pregnant and parenting students, but she's also our um, student assistant and you'll hear from her a little bit later, but I encourage you to reach out to her, um, tell her what you need, um, any suggestions, and also get involved. The information is here at the end of the year, they have elections for the following year. And if you can swing it, we are a big support to support you in, in what your duties are and what you need to do. It's a great partnership with us at the WGEC. So I encourage you to really get involved and be active um, as a leader um, here on campus. And accommodations. Um, that's real important for student parents. Um, it's also important for pregnant parent, um, pregnant uh, students as well. The Bob Murphy Access Center, which is downstairs on the first floor of our building, um, has accommodations for pregnant and parenting students on a case-by-case -case basis. Here's their website. It's really important to go to the website, sign up, or call um, to get an appointment um, because you don't know um, when that might, when you might need it. And it was really well needed during COVID when students were at home and um, student parents, you know, had conflicts in their schedules as well and needed accommodation. And this is for pregnancy too. If you find yourself needing more accommodations as your pregnant months go on, this is the place to do it. If there's any complaint though, um, we'll talk about that, I think, on the next slide. But here's the BMAC information. Again, if you don't remember all this stuff, you can always come to the WGEC and we'll point you in the right direction. And then the next one. And what is Title IX rights? Well, it's a federal civil rights law. Um, and it is not, and most people think of Title IX rights in the workplace or in sports, but it also applies to um, pregnant students on campus. So basically it says no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. We're a state institution, so we receive federal funds, so we have to um, abide by Title IX. So if you ever feel that your rights are violated, the Office of Equity and Diversity is where you would report that. Again, accommodations are through BMAC. And you don't have to remember all that stuff, just connect to the WGEC. You know, we're your one stop to kind of connect you to other things on campus. So you do have rights and you do have a voice here on campus as a pregnant and parenting student. 
And I'm not sure if I have another slide. Is that it, Brooke? Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Abby is now going to take over. Thank you, Pam. Hey, y'all. I'm going to share my screen. Is that okay, Brooke? Take a breath and one, then I'll go into my slides. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Can you share yet? Okay, there we go. Can everybody see my screen? Can you see it? The schoolwork parenting life balance screen? I can. Awesome. Okay. So hi, everybody. My name is Abby Bradish. I am one of the counselors over at CAPS. Um, I have been working with student parents on and off since 2009 here um, when I was doing my internship at CAPS. And, you know, so much has changed and grown over the last, gosh, what is that, 12, 13 years? I'm not a math major, but it's been a while. And I've just seen, at first, I think, started trying to work with Isabel Patterson and doing workshops um, and then, you know, different things and research and, you know, all over campus has grown from there. And I think a lot of the research around student parents attending college has grown from there as well. So, there's a lot of great hope and um, exciting things going on and still a lot of work to do. Um, today, I want to focus on trying to find balance as a student parent. I know it's hard. I know there's a lot going on as a student parent. Um, and then we can talk about some self-care and different coping, but please ask me any questions that you have. I'm really informal in my presentation style, so if you have anything, you can drop it in the chat. I'll try to Try to keep a lookout for that. Yes, I can see the chat now. Okay, cool. All right. So I just wanted to open it up with some research that was just published from um, some professors in uh, family and consumer sciences. And one of the quotes they took from their research about balance as a student parent. And so I'll just read that. The most challenging aspect of being a student parent is having to manage time to be able to log in. This is during COVID. With, in, with two small children into their classes and at the same time log into my own. I'm a stay-at-home mom and my husband is the only source of income and he was laid off some days. It's very stressful managing my class workloads plus my children and still do all the mother duties such as cook, clean, wash, and supervise children all day. Even though I'm in class, it's also a big distraction having children around while in the class, while in class. So um, it's a student that, you know, a quote directly from a student parent, trying to manage the, and balance the different aspects and roles and responsibilities as a student parent. I just wanted to go up briefly over some data and some research around student parents. Um, there's over 4 million plus student parents nationally across college campuses. Um, but a lot of times student parents are termed, that this term in the research comes up a lot, called invisible students because despite being 20 to 25% of students on college campuses, a lot of times like we don't know each other on, student, on college campuses or professors don't know maybe that a student is also a student parent. You know, it's really, I think campuses uh, are having difficulty figuring out how to know who is a student parent on their campus, right? And a lot of the more recent research is calling for more data around how do you gather student parents on your campus? How do you track student parents so that you can be reaching out to student parents? And I think there's efforts to do so. It's just, there's been no, especially when I first started, no tracking of student parents on campus. Uh, student parents are often fathers, mothers, and non-binary parents, though they are largely women of color, single, and have a lower income. Student parents are often unrecognized as the significant student population feeding into the stigma against these skill and skilled and ambitious student, students. Amidst an ongoing emphasis of diversity and inclusion, parenthood as a life experience should be, but rarely is included within our diversity framework. So often, I think what this article was discussing in IWPR.org is a great resource for student parent research. Um, other things that I look at is Generation Hope, there's a lot of like great work being done out there, but I just wanted to throw those out just to look at it. But I think what they're saying is there's not a lot of research inclusion around that student parent experience. And I think that there's an effort and push on college campuses to do that. 
One article I saw about the struggles, recent struggles during COVID of balancing roles spoke to this lack of institutional support, having to be a teacher to your child and your child being home, like being not just a parent and a student yourself, but also being a teacher to your child, having your tension always divided, like that cognitive shift of having to shift to do different things at once that's really taxing on our, our, our cognition, our, our, our mental capacity to shift your attention all the time, to be multitasking all the time. And then feeling like you don't belong. Like oftentimes I'll hear of student parents and my experience as a student parent, um, like feeling I just didn't fit in with my peers or they weren't gonna understand what I was going through. And, you know, unless I was pregnant, they probably wouldn't really know I was a parent. Um, so that, that experience coming up. This article talked about like trying to find community, finding activities to do with your kids. They talked about baking. We'll come back to some of that later. The research, research also talks about an uh, idea called time poverty, where you know we just run out of time. And so I'll read these quotes. Students with children must balance work, college, family caregiving needs, and their own children's education, a balancing act that has only been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Caregiving demands layered on top of the demands of work and school can lead student parents to experience time poverty or the lack of time to complete day-to-day -day responsibilities. Another quote followed saying, single mothers attending college full-time, for example, spend an aver average of nine hours per day providing care to their children and on housework, compared to just two hours a day spent on the same activities by single full-time female students without children. So that just gives you a framework of like how much time, like loss of time there are for student parents. And I, you know, as a psychologist, I think a lot of the one-to-one -one work we do is so personal. So I just really want to um, acknowledge that this is systemic work. Like this is a systemic issue. It's not just like that I'm going to be able to like bring in some coping techniques and feel better. Like, yes, there's things I can do personally, but also like working towards advocacy or finding community and shifting some, making some systemic change. So some things that I thought of in terms of the research that's come out or different things that our campus is doing or we're working on are institutional policies, right? Finding more flexibility in policies and creating really specific policies for parenting students on campus. Possible registration priorities, like because time is so limited, could student parents be having some registration priority to schedule times that work for them because they're balancing their lives with their kids. Just access and knowledge of support services. I hear a lot that student parents don't even know that these resources are available. So trying to figure out, A, I think that comes with like data on student parents and knowing who they are so the campus can reach out to them, but also really marketing what we're doing and getting that out to student parents. Um, and like Pam, you know, another, you know, I think things that we've done really well is like that family friendly support space that what Pam was talking about and different resources on campus that Cam with Pam was um, discussing. Another major issue that comes up in the research for student parents is financial assistance for student parents. There is a federal grant called C Campus. I don't know if that's how they, they I always call it when I read it. I've never heard anyone say it out loud, but it's for childcare access needs parents in school. So advocating for that nationally to become a bigger um, financial grant to student parents, that student parents can have access to that money on the state and college level for giving small institutional debts or increasing need-based financial assistance, college promise program benefits. I think some of those things when I'm thinking about like advocacy, I'm hoping for the PPSA to get more, um, to get board members so that we can start doing that work again. Cause I think the student advocacy is so very important. And Sulema in the role of the commissioner is awesome to have that student advocacy. Um, access to childcare, we know that's a huge one for student parents. Isabel Patterson is wonderful. I've heard so many wonderful things about Isabel Patterson. I also hear that it's hard to get in. So finding other resources for student parents so they have more access to childcare as well. And then finding community. Like, like Pam said, the WGEC is a hub to go to to find 
like community there, but also find access to resources and community through PPSA, through a support group, through just going to the family friendly studies center and studying together, right? Like finding community. Um, I, she mentioned Beach Parents and PPSA. Um, family and consumer science professors who also do research are also having community gatherings for student parents. I think their next one is next Tuesday, March 22nd at noon. I can try to forward that to Brooke so that she can forward it out to the, the community of y'all so that you can see it's about Play-Doh and finding community and working with kids in Play-Doh, I think. Hey, Dr. Abby. Yeah. We had a question about applying to Sea Campus. So I don't know if it's something that you can actually apply for specifically. When I asked the financial aid director at, on campus, it's something that the it goes through financial aid nationally. So I don't think it's something that we can apply for specifically. It's something we would advocate for more nationally to get those out to college campus communities. But I will also say it's definitely not my area of expertise, so I would reach out to financial aid to see what their thought is about that or how we could advocate. And sorry, I hope I wish I had better information about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. Did Tara, is that some information about C Campus? Yes, I looked it up for you. Um, you can actually uh, contact the U.S. Department of Education for applying and current application right now. The, it's open from March 3rd to June 1st. Oh, awesome. Yay, timely. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Absolutely. Uh, some other positives that come out in the research and that when, on our campus, we found this as well. Um, when we survey student parents, over 80%, there was a, a, a study done at Fresno State, 80% uh, of respondents reported that being a parent made them a better student. And similarly, in research we published in 2018, our campus found that student parents felt more motivated and a pride in their sense of self for being a student parent, as a student parent. So I think I just always want to remind us of like, that there is some, um, a lot of motivation that comes from being in school and being motivated for ourselves and our kids. Um, okay, so I am going toward a sort of toward that more personal piece of it. And I thought about a couple things that I just want to remind us of. You may have seen a wellness balance wheel in other um, maybe stress management workshops or thinking about our overall health, but I just want to put that wellness balance wheel out there to remind ourselves like, we really need to take our care of ourselves in many different ways. And I think just as a student, it becomes, you know, if you're working and doing school, a lot of our time goes to that. And then as a parent, like all of our time is eaten up. So in what ways can we find just like moments of time or when I'm on a summer break or, you know, if I can have one night where I'm watching a movie, right? Like some things to take care of our emotional health, our physical health, intellectual, diff the different pieces of our mental and emotional health. So uh, some ideas I came up with, but you know, you all probably have great ideas and ple please put them in the chat, um, share with one another things that you do to take care of your wellness and balance. I think, you know, I'll get up early. Well, I'm really not a good meditator, but I try. I know it's really, really good to meditate and breathe. So I try to remember to do that. Um, journaling you know, writing out your feelings, getting things out of your head, things you're ruminating or thinking about, but also maybe taking some time to put in a journal, things you're grateful for. Um, I think in the research they talked about that I shared earlier, they talked about baking with your kids, but maybe even taking a walk with your kids. I know um, Pilar, who used to be involved in, and she graduated, but she was the old commissioner of parenting, pregnant and parenting students. She said she would dance with her kids a lot. Up oh, face masks, home day spa. I love it. That's a great way to like connect with your kids, but also self-care. Um, trying to watch the sunset tonight. I love that. So like, it's very, very mindful, like being in the moment, noticing the world around us. And something I'm really trying to be mindful of is also being intentional about this being self-care. Cause sometimes I'll put in self-care and I'll be like, check, did it, check, did it. But I'm not really taking in that this is self-care. So I really try to be mindful of like, 
I'm taking a walk, I'm doing some journaling, I'm breathing, I'm gonna be in that moment when I can be in that moment. And I always bring up the airplane metaphor, which I'm sure everybody's heard, but you know, we, we're much better, we can't take care of our kids if we're not taking care of ourselves. We're gonna get depleted, right? Like if we're on the airplane, we have to give the air to ourselves before we can put the air mask on our kids. And so just trying to remind ourselves when that guilt comes in that we're taking care of ourselves, because I think that mom guilt, dad guilt is, is pretty intense at times that we do need this to be parents. Like to, we need to take care of ourselves to be able to take care of others and do our work and do a school. So just reminding everyone of that. I also feel like it's helpful to remind ourselves what we, about what we value. So I think this is a nice like idea around what possible values you can hold. And some may be more salient than to you than others, but looking at do these lists and saying like, yeah, it's really important to me to be with family or physical well-being is really important to me. I need to work out. Parenting is really important to me. You know, what, what things are really important to you and salient for you from this list of values and others that you could add? What are very salient to you? And are you spending time doing, where are you spending your time? So sometimes if I notice like I am spinning my wheels and spending a lot of time and doing things that I feel like I have to do, but aren't things that I value. I try to like curb how much time I'm spending there. Cause like sometimes we have to, but curb how much energy I'm putting into it so I can put energy into the things I value. So sometimes that's saying no more often to the things you feel less, less aligned with. Anyone have questions about that? Cause I'm gonna move on to the next screen for some, just to save some time. I liked this little um, description. I can't see the yellow very well on my screen, but just thinking of our emotional boundaries, our emotional wellness can be another way to find some balance in our lives. So, you know, saying on the right side, saying no without feeling guilty. I think that's a hard one. Setting priorities. So like this aligns with the values conversation, right? Setting priorities of what you need. Um, accepting and learning from mistakes, right? Like I think a lot of times we're trying to do so many things. There's gonna be times we make mistakes and it may feel bad but and it's hard, but it also helps us learn about what we need. Also finding connection, expressing and sharing emotions, seeking support, feeling like you have people who can give support. Oh, thank you, Pam. Um, positive attitude. Sometimes that's really hard. I think what I try to do is doing those gratitude things in the journal just to keep my mind like I, I can tend to go to the negative. So can I bring in some positive things or things I feel grateful for, for to remind myself of those things and find more balance? Um, and then just tune in. Like, are you aware of your thoughts and feelings? Sometimes we're an emotion. Sometimes I think we go on autopilot because there's so many things to do and we're just checking things off our list. And so can we slow down and like, how am I feeling right now? What am I thinking about? Can I pause for a little bit just to be a little bit more mindful about what's going on? So I did want to follow up. Thank you for putting all that information in Pam about Beach Parents. We did set a date. It's Wednesdays at, from 1 to 2 p.m. We've started, but it's an open group, which means people can join um, as they're referred into the group. What I would say right now is if you're interested to reach out to me by email and what I need to do is sort of do paperwork and get you as, as, into being a CAPS client and then seeing if the group's a fit for you and then going into the group then and being welcomed into the group then. We'll be running this group to the end of the semester and my hope is that we could continue it ongoing um, so that you could continue to come into the group as long as you're a Cal State Long Beach student. And Pam already put a lot of information about CAPS, so I won't go into that, but I'm also going to stay here and answer questions if there's questions now, or I think we're going to have a Q&A at the end. But thank you all so much for being here. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Abby. Um, we are now going to continue on with our student parent panel. Uh, so our student parents, let me see if I could spotlight you here so we could have a little panel moment. There we go. All right. 
So today we have uh, two student assistants from the Women's and Gender Equity Center who are also uh, student parent scholars. And then Sulema, as we put in the chat, um, is also your ASI uh, pregnant and parenting student commissioner. Do you all want to take a moment to introduce yourselves to the room? Are you gonna go first or? I can go first. Hi, my name is Tara Daniels. I am a senior here at Cal State Long Beach. I uh, transferred from uh, Long Beach uh, City College and um, I, I work at the WGEC Center. I have a 10 year old and um, a 10 year old son and throughout my uh, educational career, I have been a parent. So I'm excited to join everyone here today. Hi everyone, um, my name is Sulema Martinez. I, I am a senior, will be graduating this May. Um, my major is sociology with a minor in psychology and I am a transfer student from Cerritos College. Um, I currently work for the WGEC as a research fellow. I am also a commis the commissioner for our pregnant and parenting students. I am a mother of four children um, that range from 13 to nine, two boys and two girls. And, you know, they're in my life. Thank you both so much. Um, just knowing you both personally, you bring so much light into my life and I appreciate you both. Um, so just to start it off, uh, question number one, uh, what are some things you know, service support events that you as a student would like to see for parent, student parents on campus? Um, for me, I would like to see all of our, um, all of our food uh, stores carrying or being able to offer like EBT services. That is one thing that I would really like to see. Um, even today, I had to go and buy a sandwich because I didn't have time to make a lunch for myself. And, you know, I get I get my sons done, I get everybody else together, but I don't think about me before class. And I had to go and um, purchase my, my food through the um, convenience store. And it's something that we could, if those of us who utilize the EBT program, which most students should, it's... $150 a month for anybody who goes to Cal State at Long Beach, um, it should be offered. Another service that I think uh, we should also um, look into providing is um, like, sorry, I blinked. <laughs> um, I would like to see, um, I just wanna see more parents getting involved, more, more student parents and more, children on our campus so that we know that there is a community here. Salima? Um, yes, I, Tara, I completely agree with you. Um, for me, I think um, in addition to what Tara said, I wanna include like do events to include our children. Um, I was thinking maybe like a family movie night, um, a bowling night, for maybe just the parents also, because you know we wanna get that connection with our student parents, um, just so we won't feel alone. I feel like sometimes, aside from Tara, like I felt like I didn't have anybody else that I could talk to um, as a student. And um, I, I just want to have that. I want for our student parents to, to shine and show themselves and, uh, Thank you both for sharing. I know uh, Tara and I went and investigated kind of the EBT stamps and we did learn that they're in the process of applying for that. So hopefully there will be changes. In the meantime, the Beach Pantry, I think that's a great resource. Um, and we will keep y'all updated and send those resources later. Sulema, I hope, you know, the great thing about the Balance Series, that last one, the thing that I love is like the family incorporation. Um, so, We'll have a survey at the end, so please share suggestions for events and we could work on getting that started. Um, but I love, you know, we're building community here today. So we'll keep in touch 
um, and send this information later. So question number two, do you think it is easy to access resources? I think for me at the beginning, it wasn't, it was very hard, but thankfully because I work for the WGEC and I became a commissioner, um, I'm able to gain a lot more access. But when I started and as a transfer student, it was really hard. I felt like I, I didn't know what to do and um, I didn't know where to start. I knew that I needed the resources, but I just didn't know where to go. I agree with Salema. I was fortunate that, um, you know, I, I, I got involved with WGEC before I even came on campus because of a program that I was on at Long Beach City College. They had recommended that I become involved. Now, had I not, I don't think I would have known all the great programming that we have on campus for pregnant and parenting students. And I think that's one thing that we as uh, parenting students have to do is advocate and speak up to other parent, pregnant and parenting students and let them know where they can get these resources. All of these students here are getting these resources, but there are tons of other students who don't know. Um, so one thing that I've been doing is anytime I find out, hey, if you're a pregnant and parenting student, whether you're in my class or a program, I let you know, hey, go to the WGEC, check it out and they'll get you and they'll get you in contact with all the resources on campus for pregnant and parenting students. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, to everyone um, and all the pregnant and parenting students we have here today, come visit us please at the WGEC. We're open Monday through Friday now, eight to five, um, but connect with us as well. All right, number three. So what are some things that keep you balanced with school and family life? Um, so one of the things that I have attempted to do is um, I've reached out to family and friends to help me um, with my, my education journey. And I'm fortunate that I do have an aunt that lives close by. And if I need her, she's always available. So I would um, suggest reaching out to those that you trust with your children to see if they would be a beneficial um, person in your life to help you attain your goals. Uh, secondary is planners. I know Salama is going to go ahead and, and speak about this. She's our planner queen. But a planner, I mean, if I do simple planning and just jot down, it helps me to keep focus and helps me to maintain my tasks. Tara, you know me so well. That's, that was like my number one thing is planning. Um, I have a monthly planner, a weekly planner, and even a daily planner that it helps me keep me focused. Like I have the monthly planner because I'm able to see what's coming up next. And the daily, it's just something, I feel like when I check something off, it just makes me feel good. Um, and also, you know, when you do your planner, making it cute, because if you make it cute and, you know, aesthetically pleasing, you're able to look at it. Like you wanna look at your planner and you wanna do that. But aside from planning, um, I would recommend like having a strong support group um, at home, but also, um, you know, your family, friends. Um, I would like to say that I have my, you know, my husband and my children that are very supportive, but also my WGEC family, you know. So I know that if I ever need anything, they are there to help me and they always offer um, to support me in anything. So I thank you guys for that. You're making me smile. I love both of your planners. Like you both inspire me and my organization so much. Um, and yes, having that support, right? So again, come visit us. We're a big family at the WGC. Oh, I see that planner, Tara. <laughs> All right. Um, next question. I know you touched upon, you know, in addition to the WGEC, 
Uh, do you use any of the resources that CSULB offers? And if so, which ones? I am a TRIO and a BMAC student. I have, again, I was able to get, and I've used CAPS. Um, I feel that the resources on campus are amazing. Um, CAPS is, has um, wonderful resources if you just need to talk, if you need services for a little bit longer. Um, I think they do like six or eight sessions and then they'll help refer you to a local center if you need it or you might not. Um, I went through a death in my family, so I just needed to talk to someone for a little bit. Um, BMAC, amazing. If you're a pregnant student, I recommend going to BMAC and asking for services. You can, they can even help you get closer parking to your classes. They can help you with so much. Um, I, you know, utilizing their resources, uh, you wouldn't, it's just great to go in and talk to them, let them know what your struggles are and see if they can help you and help you attain your goals. Um, of course, I, I'm WGEC all the way. So, you know, pregnant and parenting program. I was a part of PPSA when I first started and it really helped me to get on track with my goals at Cal State Long Beach. Um, for myself also, um, I'm, I'm trying to get um, connections with BMAC, but I have been um, fortunate to use CAPS and um, Beach Parents. I feel like that is a, a great way to not only, you know, self, um, you know, get, you know, be able to talk to other students, but it feel like with Beach Parents, you're able to connect with other student parents, um, which makes you, you know, um, I'm sorry, uh, connect with them. But also I have used, you know, the WGEC, we have a, a study area computer lab at Free Prints, um, which I love that. And I've also used the Writing Center. And let me yes. add on, uh, just so you all know, I've taken advantage of the free massages on Thursday through Beach Balance. Highly recommend. It's only like a few minutes, but highly recommend. Where is that located, Tara? Someone just asked in the chat. I need to know as well because it is at the um, student uh, rec. Yeah, the student rec center. Thank you so much, and thank you for sharing all those resources. Next question, uh, what have been some positive experiences as a student parent in the classroom on campus and interactions with staff, faculty, and students? So for the, for the most part, I'm a liberal arts student. I can't speak on the other schools of learning at our campus, but as a liberal arts student, I have noticed that a lot of our um, faculty and uh, professors have been very understanding when it comes to challenges regarding like getting your work done on time and getting it in um, like getting you know needing ex extensions and whatnot most of the staff has been understanding if I needed a day or if I uh, let them know a few weeks ago my son had the fourth grade mission project had to help him on that which, as um, Dr. Bradish was talking about, left me with a time deficit. So I had to ask for a little bit of an extension. And fortunately, my, my professors were understanding as soon as I let them know, I'm a parenting student. Sometimes it just happens. Um, I feel for me, um, a positive experience was actually um, you know, getting the job with the WGEC. I was able to, um, you know, learn a lot about different programs, but um, there is another coworker there that she pushed me to become the commissioner for the uh, pregnant and parenting students. And um, being involved in ASI, um, it just, it opened up more of a connection. I feel like now, I mean, it's sad to say that I'm in my last semester, but, um, I'm able to have that 
sense of family with Long Beach. Um, and having that support, like Tara said, with the teachers, um, I feel like all of my teachers have been completely understanding. Um, and, you know, as a student parent, you know, we're sometimes overwhelmed with guilt, um, but connecting with other students um, has given me the push that I need. Thank you both for sharing. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Pam now to finish with the remainder of the questions. Um, but thank you both. It's been so nice hearing from you so far. So I just have a couple more questions I think that we have time for. And I know you said some of the positive things that you experienced with, you know, on campus with your professors, but um, what do you feel have been um, some challenges you faced as a student parent and, you know, what, what did you do um, or about it? And then, um, and you can also tell it, tell me, you know, any unique challenges that you think you faced that maybe regular students just don't ever think about. So just something that sticks out to you that you had to personally go through and what did you do? And then, you know, what do you feel that you go through that is just, um, non-existent for other students. Okay. I, I can go first. Um, for me, it's balancing. Um, as a parent, um, you never know what you're going to wake up to. It's like a roulette. Um, you know, you don't know if your children are going to wake up sick. You don't know if, um, you know, you're going to have car problems or if personally, if how your mental health is. So I think for me, it's just juggling and balancing everything. Um, you know, your kids, you know, doctor's appointments, um, you know, like Dr. Abby Bradish said, you know, being also a teacher to your students. Um, those are challenges that other um, students that don't have children do not have to deal with and then you're also competing with them also like you know academically like not in, internally you're feeling like okay well you know they're answering these questions and I don't even have time to sometimes even go through the the readings and you know you feel like you become you you start getting imposter syndrome because you don't feel that you're good enough and um for me it's those have been really challenging times, you know, being able to say that I am worth it. And I, you know, I got accepted to Long Beach. So there has to be a reason why I'm here. Um, so I know it's like more of an internal thing. Um, but yeah, um, that's, that's my, those are my things, balancing. Thank you, I absolutely agree. You know, um, one of the things that I do struggle with is a lot of times we have professors that uh, they they are very stringent on attendance and sometimes you just can't make a class if your child is is sick or came home um, throwing up you're not allowed to send them back to school right now until they have a COVID test or a 14 day um, oh what's it called a uh, quarantine and so Sometimes we're stuck in this rock or hard place. Do we find someone to sit with our child who could be contagious or need needs us, personally needs us, or do we go to school? And that's the challenge that we face every day. It's doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, um, PTA. We have um, like uh, parent-teacher conferences and Sometimes the the professors aren't accepting to that. Um, I did have a art professor who, as soon as I told her, "Hey, I'm my son's dealing with this situation. I just need an extra day or two. The moment that I said that, she said, "Oh yeah, that's fine, but I'm gonna dock you points. Why am I suffering when I am coming to this professor to say, "Hey, ahead of time, hey." I know I'm going to need an extra couple days. Can you help me? And this is something that I really feel that Cal State Long Beach is, can and is getting better at uh, providing training to our professors to allow for accommodations for pregnant and parenting students. 
I agree. Um, and I think that if anyone's facing that, that challenge, I think um, BMAC or coming to the WGEC is a good place, especially if you have advanced warning that you're giving your, your professors, because you never know when um, you, you have to have a, you know, like a surgery or something for even your child. And in that conflicts with a school schedule, an exam or something else. And you're right. You shouldn't be dinged. And I don't know when that started because I don't remember and I'm older, way older. I don't remember ever getting dinged for attendance ever. Um, there were times that you, if you didn't even go to class, you still got all the, the credit if you did the work and you, and you um, participated. So it's really hard for me to understand that, that um, really strict rule for especially student parents. And I agree that's not something that other parent, the other students have to wake up and, and face. So I'm glad that we, you know, that you are able to have those resources and, and tap into those for these challenges that you said that you have. And I have a question um, that makes me think about what advice would you um, give to an incoming student, um, whether they're new, or they become a you know parent on campus, or they're a transfer student. What what advice would you give to this you know a student parent? My biggest advice that I give to all student parents is get involved. If you're not involved, you're not gonna learn about the resources. You're not gonna learn about the people who make Cal State Long Beach an amazing place to go. Um, if I didn't know, or if I didn't reach out and meet the people that I have met, I don't think I would have sustained long enough to be a senior at Cal State Long Beach I, as a pregnant parenting student. Um, I needed those resources and I'm very fortunate that I was able to get that. So get involved and the benefit of becoming involved is you're not only gaining these resources but you're um, meeting people who could further your career once you leave cal state long beach so that's that's reach out and get involved uh, yeah i mean I, I would have to say the same thing network and um also um if you don't know of the resources talk to your professors um, a lot of them are very helpful and, um, you know, we as the WGEC, we, you know, we try to um, send messages to different departments. So a lot of, for example, my professors are like, you know, they'll put it on Beachboard. Hey, we're having an event here. We're having an event there. So if you have any questions and, and you don't know where to start, start with your professors because, you know, they're willing to help um, help you. Um, aside from that, um, you know, like Tara said, just getting involved and um, not being afraid to, you know, um, how can I say, not being afraid to just not knowing, I think, you know, that's how you start. You start with not knowing anything. And um, for me, it's like, if I don't ask questions, I'm always like, I'm, I'd rather ask questions than not know. And um, just getting involved and, you know, I, I always tell my kids the only dumb question is the question that you don't ask. So if you have any questions, just ask. And, you know, um, Long Beach is, it's, it's so, they're there to help you. And I, I, I haven't had any professors, thankfully, that have not been supportive. So um, reach out to your professors and just let them know, you know, what's going on in your situation. Thank you, um, Salima. I think that, um, some of the students that I have encountered that have had problems with their professors, um, unfortunately have been in a lot of the STEM classes. I think Tara's right about liberal arts. They're a little bit, um, um, they, they've been a little bit more accommodating for student parents. And I, and I have to say that since we've had COVID shut down and these faculty have had to be home with their own children and deal with some of the stuff our student parents have had to deal with, I think it's made them pause and think um, when you do talk about, um, you know, your, your struggles. And, and I think it's a good idea to be upfront with your professors, even at the beginning of the semester to say, hey, well, I'm a student parent and there's, I need flexibility and I'm, I'm hardworking because I think that's one thing that I feel our student parents offer and they possess is a very good work ethic um, um, to get it done. Uh, and they're serious. They're very serious where other students may not be in their undergraduate studies. So 
we might have um, time for one more question. I think Brooke, can we take something from the from from any of the students if they'd like to ask a question that we haven't asked yet? Uh, yeah, I was thinking, um, you know, we can, we'll open it up for the Q&A and that can be for our panel um, and for our speakers as well. So yeah, if Tara or Sulema, is there anything like else that you'd like to share um, before, you know, we transition to the Q&A? Is there anything else that you'd like to share that might be helpful for our student parents here today? One thing that I'd like to share, because I had to take an extra semester, don't beat yourself up if you have to take an extra semester if you have to take you know extend your graduation a lot of student parents have to we have a lot of a lot on our plate and it's not fair to you to as a student as a parenting student to keep yourselves at at the same level as other parent or other students who are not parenting students if you have to take that extra semester, whether it's one class or three classes or five classes, take it. It's better for your mental health and it's better for your children if you are able to focus on the whole picture. I think for me is um, just try to do your self care. Um, I know it's a lot easier to say than to do because I mean I struggle through the same thing, but I've noticed that um, I've been taking uh, I took a meditation class for stretch and relaxation and that has helped me completely. Um, I'm able to learn breathing exercises and um, as parents, as student parents, you know we get overwhelmed. I actually just got a memo from my watch saying that my heart rate went up just because I'm talking about everything. So I feel like, you know, we, we are so stressed out all the time, even just for me sitting down and just thinking like everything that I have to do or I, I have to go through, but just know that um, the WGEC and myself, and we're all here for you. If you have any questions or if you just need someone to talk to, um, we are here. I know I rec highly recommend uh, Beach Parents. Um, so just put yourself out there and network and just get involved, get involved. Thank you both so much um, for being here today and for sharing that. I'm going to unpin you, bear with me, um, so that we can, you know, all see each other and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. And I appreciate um, talking about uh, the um, the self care because I think the beach balance at the student rec center. You guys are paying these fees anyways. You might as well take advantage of student rec and wellness center. It's great energy over there. Beach balance is great, and I think that stretch and relaxation class is from the student rec center. And so, really take advantage of that opportunity to um, to go over there and check it out. Yeah, definitely. I didn't know about the massage chairs in the student union either. I just saw that in the chat. Um, I'll, I'm going to be going over there now. Tara and Suleyma, you come with me too. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, uh, take this time now, uh, the remainder of our time to open it up for a Q&A. So feel free to unmute. Um, and these questions can be for student parents, um, Dr. Abby, Pam, um, so yeah, feel free to unmute or put any questions in the chat. For the services at CAPS, when you do like um, your one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions, are those sessions uh, just to basically have like a sounding board or are they to also diagnose you if you may have some sort of mental illness that you are unaware of? That's a really good question. Um, I guess it would somewhat depend on what you were looking for. I'll be honest, for me, I don't do a lot of diagnosing at CAPS because for different reasons, like we're seeing each other for such a short period of time in terms of maybe 
I think someone mentioned certain, there aren't session limits necessarily at CAPS. We say brief therapy. So, but on average it's three to four, four to five. I, I usually say to students four to six sessions, a little more, a little less, depending on your needs, right? Um, the, the, I guess the thing is that it's not longer term therapy. And so if we're looking for that, sometimes we make that um, connection to longer term therapy or do that early on to get students connected. There are times where I'll make a diagnosis for students if they need a referral to BMAC to, in order to be have services at BMAC. So I guess it depends on what you're looking for. There's definitely supportive therapy at CAPS, but there's also a lot of really structured therapy around um, coping, anxiety, depression. Like it, it can be sort of what you're, what you're looking for. I think you could ask for what you're looking for at the first session and then see with the therapist what that might look like. And I, I guess I don't want to over promise and under deliver. I think every therapist is probably a little different there. Everybody works a little bit differently, but those are overarching, like how we approach, we, we call the first session an initial consultation just to see what's going on. I sort of describe it almost like a first doctor's office visit where we're getting your history and it's more of like the family history, emotional history, than more of like the medical side, but we'll ask about that too. And then from there, make like a plan, whether it's brief therapy, group therapy, psychiatry, we have a psychiatrist on staff, or getting students connected. So there's a lot of different things that we can look toward in, once we um, have that first session. But there's also crisis services at CAPS. If someone's like, I can't wait, like something's happening right now, I need to talk to someone immediately. We also have counselors available for crisis sessions as well. I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, it's very, um informational because I've been trying to see a therapist for the last few months but trying to find somebody in network is such a pain it very it is very much it's very difficult and so even if you decided like hey I don't know if I want to start at CAPS because I know it's short term we have case managers on staff that you could say like, hey, I'd rather meet with someone in the community. Can I be connected with a case manager so they can help giving me resources? Because we also have a database of therapists in the community that we often work with that I know from our insurance companies, we get like long lists and it's hard to know, like, who do I go to? It's a little bit overwhelming. And so we have a database that like pairs it down. And students have either said, we like working with this provider. We've heard good things. Like if we don't hear good things, we'll take them off our list. So um, our case managers who are social workers can help students get connected if you want to just sort of bypass that initial session. So that's another option. I'd like to add that we also, and probably one of the connections you do have, Dr. Bradish, is the um, Long Beach Trauma Recovery Center. Most people don't know that exists, but they see a lot of our students on campus at the clinic on campus. But they are located in St. Mary's um, on the eighth floor. And if you go to their website, you can um, do a brief, like, here's my name, number, and they call you back within 72 hours to give an intake. So if you feel like you've gone through any kind of trauma, whether it's been in the past or recent, um, you've, you know, been a witness to a crime or anything that, a shooting, um, anything that's been very traumatic in your life, these services are all free. It's a, um, it's a, you know, a method that they go through and a, and a process. It isn't like total long-term, but they do have a certain um, a proven method. I, I want to, uh, what, what do you say, Dr. Bradish? It's like, it was like a 12 week or program. Like or, a, from what I know, and I, I did not in the program, but I think it's like a 16 week protocol. Yeah. 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 And so it's just all to help you not have that, you know, part of your brain that gets triggered by trauma um, and in being able to get past that trauma. And um, so that's another option too, but um, definitely reach out to the services and to CAPS to kind of get you connected either short-term or that long-term plan. Because I always think of mental wellness as, as being an athlete. Some of us have a gift of, of we've just got it and it's been easy for us to be an athlete and then others had to work really hard to obtain and never get to that Olympic status, right? Well, mental wellness is the same way. Some people don't have to work that much at it and others do. And sometimes we have that stigma about well, why me? You know, why do I have to work so hard at this? Well, sometimes it just is. And, you know, 
and that self-care is what helps us, you know, get through it. But just having that as your daily routine, like Dr. Bradish said, you know, having that routine, getting up, Selene was saying, you know, doing these things, you know, help you get through those, those um, increased responsibilities and stressors in, in your life when you're a student parent. I just thought I'd add that. Thank you, Pam. I put the um, the resource you were talking about in the chat. I also um, I had experience where my caps like short term ended, so I did work with a caseworker who put me in contact with uh, community resources. You can like ask them for specific groups you want to be a part of, um, and they give you that network as well. I also the LGBTQ Center of Long Beach has great uh, services and groups as well. Um, so. That's my little plug there for them. They're amazing. I just wanted to, you know, get a sense of the group. How many student parents are here today? Or if you want to, you know, introduce yourselves in the chat as well, so we can build that community here. Or you can put like you can do the reaction too, if you put a hands up or, you know, we'll know you, you're a student parent too to be connected and um, and then also, um, you know, reaching out to us and then um, we also there's a new app on on campus too for student parents that if you get connected with us and we have it on our newsletter, or if you come into the center, we'll help you get connected on that new app. Yeah, that's great. I see a few uh, hands raised there. And then also, yeah, a few individuals that were here earlier are in um, our student development and higher education cohort. So that was great. We'll definitely make sure to share um, the resources in the presentation today. Are there any other questions or comments you have for any of our speakers or our panelists today? All right, well, I will feel free to put it in the chat too. If anything comes up, I'm gonna pull up the last slide of our presentation. Um, that will include a Linktree QR code. I'll pull it up. And that will connect you to our website, which does have a tab specifically for um, pregnant and parenting students. So a lot of the resources that we discussed today are going to be on that website. We also have our resources through the WGEC. So we have um, a lot of events you know, for in spaces, including the Women's Collective, which is a group for, um, you know, women and women of color on campus. We have the retreat coming up. So if you scan that code, you could also sign up um, for our newsletter, follow us on social media so you can stay connected with us and hear about, you know, the remainder of our events and also, you know, our upcoming balance series. Did uh, Tara, Sulema, or Pam, did any of you want to mention the next balance series event that we have? Yeah, I can. Um, it's coming up April 6th. It's the same time. It'll be on a Wednesday. It's going to be on a Wednesday from 3.30 to 5 virtual. And at this one, we will be talking about balancing that the um, COVID restrictions with the academic success of your, of your child. And we will have representatives um, from different school districts coming to speak to us about that, as well as that self-care again and resources for that. And also um, representatives from the Long Beach um, Unified School District Family Resource Center. Um, and we do, we will have um, Karen Kinsley, a representative of the BMAC. Um, where we were just talking about that's where you go for accommodation. She will be talking as a, um, a parent, though, um, for taking care of special needs 
children and being, you know, a student and, you know, um, being on campus. So I really hope that you can join us. That will be in our newsletter on our social media. So please follow us. And that will um, be our next one. And then Tara, did you want to say anything about the April one also that's coming up that we're going to do with families? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm confused as to which one. Do we have another one coming up in April other than the April 6th one? The program you're planning, Tara, I think. Oh, um, yes, I am in April. The date has not been set yet. Um, it's to, to be announced, but we will be having an LGBTQ parenting, um, program and it will uh, have resources as well as um, speakers from the community regarding um, how to become or if you are a LGBTQ parent um, just uh, the just resources and uh, guidance on uh, solely for LGBTQ IA plus um, parents. So if you identify as that, I would love to see you with or see you there. Thanks, Tara. And like again, again, if you follow us on social media and sign up for our newsletter, um, when we have that available, we'll you'll you'll see it in our newsletter and also on our social media. So stay tuned. Brooke, is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, so um, just, you know, I'm looking forward to those events, Tara, too. That's such a great um, population that often, you know, we don't think about that. And there's definitely the need. I know myself, I would love to learn about the options, you know, that I have when I would like, me and my partner would like to, you know, maybe have children that might be down the line. But anyways, uh, I just wanted to thank, you know, all the speakers we had today, Tara, Sulema, um, and then also Dr. Abby, Pam, um, you know, great resources shared. Dr. Abby, did you want to touch upon anything or remind them about the Beach Parents Group? Yeah, if you, yeah, it's Wednesdays one to two um, weekly. The only week we won't meet is spring break, and then we'll go to the end of the semester of the classes. So please feel free to reach out to me and uh, we'll set up an appointment for you to get your information and to join the group. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, so please, you know, scan that QR code on the left. That's going to allow you to stay connected with us. Um, we'll also have the links, you know, to CAPS and Beach Parents. Um, and we have, you know, the contact information listed there. The QR code on the right is going to be our survey. Please, please, please fill that out. Um, and you know, put those suggestions for those future events. We talked about bowling. We talked about, you know, trying to build that community, right, with our student parents. So we look forward to the future events that we're having and staying connected with you all. I uh, will make sure to email you um, tomorrow as well with some information. Pam, did you want to add anything? No, I think that's it. Thank you so much. And just if you don't remember anything at all, just remember the WGEC is the place to start and um, we'll get you connected to all the things that you heard here or if, if we, they weren't mentioned here as far as like academic um, information you need for help, tutoring, for writing. Um, I know we're getting ready to get into midterms and you know like finals. Um, we, you know, reach out to us and we'll point you in the right direction. Yeah, definitely. We have a uh, student assistance, you know, staffed in the center. I know I myself, I'm a grad student and I utilize the writing center, the tutoring. Um, so again, visit us. We're on the second floor of the student success center. It's a brand new building. Uh, it's a great space to, you know, lounge, study, and then connect with other students, right? And one of us there should have the answer. And if not, we're going to help you find the answer. So please come visit us. I'll now pass it over to Gabby to share a few words.
Yeah, thank you. I just want to echo what Brooke said. Thank you to our student speakers, Suleyma and Tara. Thank you for opening up your lives to us in this space. Thank you to Dr. Abby, Pam, Brooke for putting this together. And also, if you all know folks and students who are working on becoming teachers or on the teacher pathway or thinking about it, please refer them to the Caminos project. We're in the EED building. Uh, Brooke, feel free to give out my email to folks. We support students who are on the teaching pathway, undergrads and post -bac students alike. So definitely uh, send out our information to folks as well. And just thank you so much all for being here. Uh, thank you for this space. Truly appreciate it. And, you know, it's really just about spreading the love, spreading the resources and, you know, building community. And I really appreciate you all for this time and space. And yeah, it's almost five o'clock. Uh, so we know you all have busy lives and have things to do. So thank you so much, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we'll stick around, I guess, for a couple minutes if anyone